we are going to pick up with our discussion on molarity. What's a mole? Someone give me a definition of a mole. It's a number of moles. Yeah. It's nice to make up one mole, but I can't get mole every definition okay. of mole. It's a number of molecules, 6.02 times 10 to the 23. And so one mole is 6.02 times 10 to the 23 molecules. We went through the process of weighing out to be able to measure out one mole. And you basically find the molecular weight from one molecule of the dolphins, convert that, or just swap out really the dolphins from grams. We did the example of glucose, which we discovered had 180 dolphins per molecule, so 180 grams to give us 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules for one mole. The next step from here is to take that mole, which is typically going to be solid, although it could be a liquid or a gas. But in biology, a lot of times it's a solid material, like a glucose or a sodium chloride or something like that, and dissolve it into water because everything in biology is in water. It's all aqueous solutions. When we put that mole into one liter of water, definitionally we get molarity. So molarity is just simply moles per liter. Moles per liter of solution. If we have one mole in one liter, we call that a molar solution. And that molar solution we represent just simply now these are, uh, we can subject molar to um, scientific units. So we could have a decimal or a centimolar. Most common it's either going to be mole, molar, millimolar, or micromolar. He's reducing by a factor of a thousand. So if I weigh out a material, which you can see here, I don't know what the material is, it's green. We weigh it out, and then we pour it into a small amount of water, and then mix it up, and then fill the rest of the way up to one liter, we would have a one molar solution. One mole of solution per liter of water, or one mole of substance per liter of water, I should say. Okay? So the first step is going to always be to weigh out the appropriate number or the appropriate amount of whatever material you're working with. So let's try a little bit of a problem here. We'll go from there. We want to prepare a two molar solution of glucose. Two molar solution of glucose. So first step, step number one. We want to calculate our molar weight or, or our mole, mole mass for glucose. Can anyone remember? One mole of glucose? 180. How about if I want to put two moles into a liter of water or make a two molar solution. 360, just going to double. So I calculate and then weigh. Two moles, which is approximately 360 grams of glucose. So calculate and then weigh out the two moles, 360 grams in the case of glucose. So now that I have my 360 grams of material, I'm going to add that material to a small amount of water. And so it may be 400 
no leaders one, and then we go full ground, or full leader one. And I want to mix or I want to stir after I've had it to get it incorporated. Then from there, final step. is to fill to one liter with water. Okay? Why don't I just fill up one liter of water and dump it myself? What will change? The concentration is actually not going to really be a one molar concentration because that one liter of water, when I put that solute in it, it consumes some of the space as well. And so it ends up causing there to be a higher volume than just one liter of total solution. <laughs> that would actually be morality. You can run into that in the chemistry, not so much in biology. Which is one liter of water with substance mixed in. We're going to use molarity much more frequently in biology. So let's try a different approach here. What if I only want 500 milliliter or two molar glucose solution? I only want half as much solution. How would I approach that? Speak up. Can you say? Let's do it from a practical purpose. So like for two molar, you would use one you would use one mole of the solute, but half the water. Okay. You're you're getting in the right direction here. So to make up my five hundred milliliters two molar glucose, I still need to have the equivalent of two moles in a liter of water, but since I only want 500 milliliters, I can cut everything in half. So I cut the water in half, and then I cut my two moles of glucose in half, which means I weigh out one mole of glucose and mix it in by 500 milliliters of water, and it's 500 mils of two molar glucose solution. Does everybody sort of see what I'm saying? It all goes back to the number of molecules that you're going to want to have present per unit of the solution. Right. So if you look at a two molar solution, if it's a liter of water, you have two times 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd molecules. Okay. If I take the same amount of glucose, the 360 grams, and I put it into 500 mils, I now have four times as much of what I would really need per unit of, of solution. So you have to constantly kind of be thinking in terms of, okay, what would it be like if one liter? How do I reduce from one liter? What's the, what's the proportion or the fraction I need to go from one liter to 500? It's half in this case. Because we can also call one liter 1,000 milliliters. To go down to 500 milliliters, this is 50% of 1,000. So it's a factor of two. So take that factor of two to get from the 1,000 over here to the 500 and apply that to my glucose as well. Two moles of glucose is 360, but I'm taking it by a factor of two, so really I only want 180 grams of glucose, which is one mole. And I'm going to take that one mole and put it into 500. Does that make sense? Does everybody sort of see what I'm saying? Let's try one. Two hundred fifty <laughs> milliliters. That's a one molar solution of glucose. So start from here. 1,000 milliliters, right? 
And so how do I get to the 250? It's a factor of four. Take that four and apply it to my one mole of glucose. How much is one mole of glucose by? 180. I'm going to take that 180 divided by four, and I end up with 45. Take 45 grams, mix it in my 250 mils of water. I have 250 milliliters. That's a one mole. Now, where it becomes a little bit more difficult is when I do this. 100 milliliters of a 0.5 molar glucose. Okay? So you still can do the same thing. 1,000 milliliters to get to 100. What's my factor? 10. Now, over here, I've been giving you one. Now we've got a, a half. So you actually have to deal with the half first. So the way you would deal with a half is just simply say, how much is one mole? It's 180. What is this, the, what is this a factor from one mole to a half a mole? This is a one mole to a half a mole is a factor of two. So divide the 180 by two. It gives me 90, but I still need to adjust for this over here. So it'd be nine. Does everybody sort of follow that? I still can see it. No. Okay. Lots of math. And that's why math is so important to biology, because it's all based on mathematics, physics, and chemistry. Are you getting hurt? Yeah, so. I'm adjusting, when I have something that's not a one molar solution, I have to adjust both the liquid component and the solid component. Okay? So we start out, this, this makes sense, right? If I have a thousand, but I'm, or if I'm going to a hundred milliliters, I have to adjust by a factor of ten. Right? Are you with me? Over here, I'm saying, well, how much is one mole versus 0.5 mole, half mole? This to this is a factor of two. Okay, you with me there? So if it was just a thousand milliliters, if, if we just ignore this for now and I just want a thousand milliliters or one liter to get a half molar solution, I can take my 180, which is one mole and divide it by two to get to my half mole, right? Which is 90 mil, or 90 mole, 90 grams. Does that make sense? But now I'm saying I want it only a hundred milliliters of volume and not a thousand milliliters. So I have to adjust the, mo the molarity based off of the hundred milliliters. So it was originally how much over here from one mole to a half mole? How many grams of glucose did I need? 90. I have to now adjust it by a factor of 10. Right? 90 divided by 10 is 9. So I would measure out to make what it comes down to. Doing all that math, I can now take 9 grams of glucose and put it into total volume of 100 milliliters. And that's going to be my half molar solution. Because look at what, look how I can check this. Adjust this back up to a thousand mils. If I'm trying to make a half molar solution, I adjust that back up to a thousand mils. How much, how many grams of glucose would I then need? Also just by a factor of 10, that becomes 90 grams. Is 90 grams half mole compared to 180? Yes. Are you getting that? Yeah. Anybody else? Gary, what's your name again? Cameron. 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 Cameron.
you spend a lot of your time getting this kind of stuff up, except for it's not molds, it's like molds and nano molds and chicken molds. So you spend a lot of time. I have to make up this solution that contains this amount of hydrochloric acid, this amount of primer, this amount of this, this amount of this, and you use it, and then you start to actually physical. I got notebooks that are just loaded with that because I need to pull stuff. So are we pretty good with the concepts of moles, molarity, making up molar solutions? Another place it's going to show up is in anatomy and physiology when you start to look at fluid compartments inside of the cell. The cell is going to have molar concentrations. Right? There's going to be a molar concentration of sodium inside of the cell. There's going to be a molar concentration of glucose inside of the cell. So it is going to show back up, and it's good if we kind of know how those things are done. So we are continuing our conversation here on the characteristics of water. One more really important characteristic here, I'm um, actually going to talk to two of the really related to pH, and then uh, we'll also talk about buffers, which are related to pH. So someone give me a definition of pH. Okay, so really pH, the definition that's best is that it's minus the log of the concentration of hydrogen. And what we're doing is we're quantifying the amount of hydrogen protons that are present inside of the solution. All right? We're going to start with just plain water. This is water with nothing, nothing else in it. It's just H2O. So I said it's just H2O, which in reality that's not entirely true because water actually exists as a mixture. Now, does anyone remember the definition for a mixture? A solvent and a solid put together, right? So if I pour salt into water, I have a mixture of sodium and chloride inside of that water. Well, water itself is actually a mixture, meaning that I have H2O and I have something else. And in all reality, I have two other things. A couple of you have water bottles. Right now, you're drinking this mixture called water. Most common in this mixture is a molecule called H2O. So H2O is the most common molecule in this mixture <laughs> called water. What that means is I have molecules that have two hydrogens and a single oxygen. And we've already drawn out what those molecules look like. 104 degrees, 104.5 degree angle in there between the hydrogens. We know that this side of the molecule is negative. This side over here is positive. There's all of those characteristics. That's the molecule that we've been talking about. It is the most common molecule that we're going to find if we're going to go through and count the number of H2O molecules in this mixture of water on the table right here. But we have two additional items that we can find inside of the mixture of water. One of them is called the hydronium ion. Now, the hydronium ion is going to have a plus one charge. And it is going to be H3O plus. Now, hopefully, you're kind of recognizing that, hey, there's not really that much difference here between H3O plus and H2O. I'm going to get to how we produce that here in just a second. The other item that we have is hydroxide, <laughs> which has a negative one charge, and we represent as OH minus. So we have H2O, which is neutral. We have H3O, which is positive, and we have OH, which is negative. Now remember that we can form hydrogen bonds 
between individual water molecules, right? And that's a short, really quick interaction that affixes two molecules together. In fact, I have it represented here on the screen. You can see that I have two hydrogen, or I'm sorry, two water molecules, H2O. I've created a hydrogen bond here between the oxygen and this hydrogen. What would happen if that hydrogen bond was a little bit stronger in the direction of the oxygen? And I stole that hydrogen. So this hydrogen now affixes and is attached to this molecule. So now I have another hydrogen here. I'm missing a hydrogen here. And what's left over is I have three hydrogens and an oxygen because I have an extra hydrogen, which is basically a proton. I have a positive charge. Where I lost this hydrogen, it now becomes OH, which is a hydroxide because I'm missing that proton. It has a negative charge. Okay. In other words, what I'm saying is in that molecule or in that bottle of water, those molecules of H2O are interacting through hydrogen bonds. How fast do they happen? How fast does the hydrogen bond form and reform in water? I don't remember. Trillionth of a second. If it's happening in a trillionth of a second, that means that in one second, if you were to kind of measure the number of hydrogen bonds that form in a mixture of, or in a bottle of water in one second, it's going to be trillions and trillions of hydrogen bonds form, right? All of them are forming, I mean, constantly forming, fast than I can snap my fingers, trillions and trillions and trillions. That means this interaction right here is happening at a super high frequency. And most of the time, it's pretty benign. You have the water, they affix, and then they separate. But because of the high probability and the high frequency that those hydrogen bonds are forming, occasionally you get this kind of weird situation where one of the hydrogens shifts over to the other molecule and you're left over with hydronium and hydroxide ions. One positively charged, one negatively charged. Okay? So when we look at water, H2O by far, if we were to, let's say we were looking at a million molecules of water, we would have 999,098 molecules that were H2O. One that was the hydronium ion, one that was the hydroxide. <laughs> and those are made up numbers, don't quote those numbers. I'm just trying to illustrate the point that most of it is H2O. But we still have those two ions that are going to be present. And they're going to have some effects on the characteristics of water. All right? Does everybody kind of see what I'm getting at here? Now, as far as the hydronium ion goes, another way that I can represent the hydronium ion is just to call it H plus. I can just represent it by its extra hydrogen. So I can treat it for all the practical purposes just simply as a proton, H plus. Because remember that there's no neutrons in the, in the nucleus of hydrogen. You remember that? Hydrogen has got just a proton in its nucleus and just an electron floating around that proton. So I'm going to just call that H3O plus. I'm just going to refer to it simply as H plus from this point forward, just simply as a proton or as a hydrogen ion. So putting it in that simplified form, we have H2O, normal water, but we also are going to have hydrogen present, and we're going to have OH minus present. And we actually know the concentration of both OH and the H within a normal mixture of water. The concentration 10 to the minus 7 molar. Let me write that in a slightly different way. Point. 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1 <coughs> molar. In fact, that is a million times smaller than one mole or one molar solution. You could go through the process of calculating how many molecules that is. Basically, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd divided by 
zero, 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 one. Right? It's going to be that fraction, whatever, one over one. One divided by 1.0 is called zero, 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 one times Avogadro's number. And that will give you the number of molecules of hydrogen or proton and hydroxide. So this 10 to the minus 7 molar, or 0 0.0000001 molar, is the concentration in a liter of water that we should expect to find naturally in these two charged particles, these two ions. Now I can actually change that 10 to the minus 7 molar, or in other words, I can change the concentration of hydrogen versus hydroxide. Notice that they're equal, right? In, in this bottle of water, sitting up here on the front of the table, they're equal in concentration. I have a concentration of hydrogen that equals 10 to the minus 7 molar. And in that same bottle of water, an OH minus that is 10 to the minus 7 molar. They're in equal concentration. Is everybody with me? We are going to have certain ingredients that change the concentration. That's what these brackets mean. Hopefully you caught on to that. that. Read that as concentration of whatever is inside there. Concentration of hydrogen, concentration of hydroxide, concentration of ions. So certain ingredients, things that I can put into a water, a liter of water, is going to change the concentration of those ions that are present inside of that solution. Anyone happen to know what we call those ingredients? We call them acids and bases. So we have acids and bases that are going to need these certain ingredients that can alter the concentration of those ions within that mixture of water. So hydrochloric acid, you all know that that's an acid because it says this is an acid. Notice that hydrochloric acid is a chlorine molecule and a hydrogen, or a chlorine atom and a hydrogen atom. When they get put, when hydrochloric acid gets put into water, they dissociate. It's an ionic bond, and the chlorine and the hydrogen dissociate. So now, in that mall, in that container of water, I, I have chlorine, but ignoring that for a second, I also have H plus hydrogen proton that I've just put in, right? So if I put hydrochloric acid into a mixture of water, what happens to the concentration, in general terms, up or down, the concentration of the hydrogen ion in that mixture of water? Add hydrochloric acid to water, the concentration. The concentration is going to increase. I'm going to go from 10 to the minus 7, which is the same as 0 0.000001, and I may go to 1, bigger concentration, or 0.1. It's still a bigger concentration. Or 0 0.000001, still a bigger concentration. The concentration of hydrogen increases. I have more hydrogen present now. Down here on the bottom, sodium hydroxide. I have sodium. We can ignore that. I have the hydroxide. Sodium is just carrying the hydroxide. Again, I have a bond. I put it into water. They dissociate. I now have hydroxide that has increased inside of the solution. So what happens to the concentration of the hydroxide ion in this case? Increases or decreases when I put sodium hydroxide in the water? It's increasing. Same thing here. It goes from 10 to the minus 7 
towards one molar, two molar, three molar, it's increasing in concentration. Acids will add hydrogen. Bases, they add hydroxide, but in reality what happens with the base is that hydroxide interacts with the existing hydrogen and it becomes H2O and becomes water. So the bases are actually going to scavenge and remove the hydrogens, whereas hydrochloric acid is going to add the hydrogen or add protons. So both acids and bases are really changing the prevalence or the quantity of hydrogen within a solution. One of them is just simply adding the acids, add the hydrogens, whereas the bases, the sodium hydroxide, goes and scavenges or grabs hydrogens and turns it into water, and so it's no longer a hydrogen proton, it's water. And so you reduce the, high, the prevalence of the hydrogen the concentration of the hydrogen. So acids increase the prevalence or the concentration of hydrogen, and you have that effect. That equation there, HCl becoming hydrogen in chlorine, you can clearly see that there's more hydrogen after you put hydrochloric acid into a solution. Bases are going to increase the hydroxide ion, but as they increase the hydroxide ion, they scavenge the hydrogens, convert those hydrogens, or put those hydrogens back into water, and so they have an ability to decrease the prevalence of hydrogen in the solution. <laughs> so it all comes back to what's going on with the hydrogen. You put acid in, increases the concentration of hydrogen. You put bases in, it scavenges the hydrogen and decreases the concentration of the hydrogen. Now, in terms of acids and bases, Acids and bases can be categorized into either strong acids or bases. And what a strong acid and base means, so I got an example here, I'm going to go through this in just a second. A strong acid and base, uh, whenever you see a strong acid or base being used in a chemical equation, you're going to know it because it's going to have that one-sided arrow, so it's not going to be a reversible reaction. It's going to be an irreversible reaction, just goes in one direction. And what that is saying is that the strong acid dissociates completely, so there's no leftover acid. It completely dissociates into product. Once it's dissociated completely, it does not go back to being that acid, so it's irreversible. Hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide are both strong acids and bases. You put hydrochloric <laughs> acid into a water solution and it completely dissociates into chlorine and into hydrogen and it does not go back to hydrochloric acid. Whereas a weak acid and base, we're going to represent those with the double sided arrows meaning that this is a reversible reaction. So you have this kind of dynamic equilibrium or this balance where you've had incomplete dissociation of the acid or the base into the solution to become the product and then the product reverts back into the, the substrate. So these weak acids dissociate incompletely and reversibly. Now it's going to be the weak acids and bases that become really critical for most biological systems. We have buffering systems. Basically, we have the ability in certain solutions where we can keep the pH right around neutral or right around 6.5, right around a livable pH. And it's based off of the presence of weak acids, weak acids and weak bases. The strong acids and bases, even though we use those routinely in biological assay and things like that, 
we're not going to use those for buffering systems because you can't kind of balance back and forth between the acid in the product, the acid in the product, or the base of the product. Okay? So we'll come back to some weak acids as we begin to discuss buffers here, hopefully in just a few minutes. But before we do that, well, let me take you over here and kind of um, show you what's going on with this figure here. So here it is, maybe this is hydrochloric acid. The chlorine's in green, the oxygen is in white. Okay, I take that hydrochloric acid and I put it into a solution of water. And what you can see is that that acid represented by H and A, basically hydrogen and the rest of the acid, becomes a positively charged hydrogen. So all of the protons are out here in solution. And then the acid left over, which is a negative charge, which promote for hydrochloric acid to be the chlorine. So the hydrogen, the proton, releases fully and then leaves the chlorine negatively charged, and it cannot go back in this direction to reform hydrochloric acid. So that's a strong acid or a strong base. Whereas over here, we have a weak acid. And notice that if we take that weak acid, 100% of it, um, you know, whatever this is, maybe it's citric acid. And so you have the citrate and you have the hydrogen. You take that and put it into a solution of water and notice that you still have some undissociated citric acid. But you have some hydrogens that have formed. So here's one right here. And then you have some of the leftover negatively charged part of the molecule that is going to be present as well. And so this can go back and forth between producing the ions and then the ions reassociating uh, re to form that full acid molecule. Okay. So it's not complete dissociation like we saw over here. It's more of a dynamic interaction where the molecule forms and reforms in a dynamic way. So all of this discussion leads up to this thing called the pH scale. This is just one example of the pH scale. Do you know that as you tend towards zero on the pH scale, you're getting closer and closer to being totally acidic? And as you tend towards 14 on the pH scale, it's becoming more and more alkaline or basic. The pH scale, again, is a model that humans use to be able to describe what's going on in a watery solution based off of the concentration of the hydrogen in that solution. So the pH scale gives us the ability to quantify the amount of hydrogen or concentration of hydrogen that is present inside of the solution. Okay? The pH scale gives us the ability to quantify the amount of hydrogen that can be inside of the solution. Someone tell me what that, how to read that. The hydrogen with the brackets around it. How would you read that, 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 that denotation? Concentration of hydrogen. As the concentration of hydrogen increases, okay, so what does that mean? If the concentration of hydrogen is increasing, okay, and I'm getting more hydrogen ions, right? I have more H. Plus. <laughs> so if I go from 10 to the minus 7, to 10 to the minus 5. That's supposed to be 2. 10 to the minus 7 to 10 to the minus 5. I've increased the number of hydrogen ions in the solution. I'm getting closer to 1. I'm moving away from 0. Right? So this is going to be an example of an acid or an acidic solution. Okay. 
Okay, so we're increasing the concentration of hydrogen, the amount of hydrogen that's present. If I take OH, what does OH do to hydrogen? It scavenges or traps that hydrogen, right? So the hydrogen interacts with the OH to form water, and so it's no longer a hydrogen proton. So if I put in something that contains an OH or something that can scavenge, can scavenge the hydrogen, what happens to the concentration of hydrogen? It's decreasing. Okay, so in terms of 10 to the minus 7, someone would give me an example of a lower concentration of hydrogen or a decreased concentration of hydrogen. 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9, 10 to the minus 10, those are all examples of lower and lower amounts of hydrogen. What kind of solution is this? Yep, it would be basic or alkaline. Okay, so now again we're going to do some more math here. And then we'll all hate it. A couple rules that we need to follow in terms of the pH scale. If I take hydrogen, the concentration of hydrogen, and the concentration of OH, they're normally in water that has nothing else in it, no other ingredients. They're normally 10 to the minus 7. So the concentration of hydrogen equals 10 to the minus 7 molar in a normal solution of water, nothing else in it, just water. The concentration of the hydroxide ion, 10 to the minus 7 molar. Now, if I take, this is where it becomes interesting. If I take the concentration of hydrogen and I multiply it times the concentration of hydroxide, which is like doing this 10 to the minus 7 times 10 to the minus 7 for a water solution that has no other ingredients in it. Does anyone happen to remember how to do those types of problems? Yeah, we're going to add the exponents. So what's minus 7 plus minus 7? To make it a 14. So this is 10 to the minus 14. Now what about my, really this is molar, molar, right? What do I do with my molars? They're going to be squared. 10 to the minus 14 molar squared. So in any solution, whether it's a normal solution with no extra ingredients or a solution with extra ingredients, I can always take the concentration of hydrogen I can all and, and the concentration of, of the hydroxide, multiply them together, and I'm always going to get 10 to the minus 14 molar squared. Always. What does that mean? It means that this principle right here, hydrogen and in the hydroxide ion are always in an inverse proportional relationship. So as the concentration of hydrogen increases, I have to have a decrease in the concentration of hydroxide. So they're going to be inverse. So if my concentration of hydrogen was 10 to the minus 1 molar, I know that my hydroxide ion has to be 10 to the minus 13 molar, because minus 13 plus minus 1 equals minus 14, right? So they're going to be inversely proportional. I increase hydrogen. I'm decreasing hydroxide. If I increase hydroxide, I'm decreasing the hydrogen. It's always going to happen. This relationship can be this relationship can be depicted on a 10 base log scale. So the relationship between hydrogen 
in a hydroxide ion, but we can represent it as a 10 base log on scale. Right. A couple things to note about the 10 base log scale. Um, that's what we would actually refer to as the pH scale. It's logarithmic, and what it means is as we go from 7 to 6, that's 10 times more acidic. As I go from 6 to 5, that's 10 times more acidic. As I go from 7 to 5, it's 100 times more acidic. Okay? Because of the, the base 10 logarithm, logarithm that we're doing here. So, if I'm at a pH of 7 and my blood goes down to a pH of 5, it's 100 times more acidic. It's not just two units more acidic, it's 100 times more acidic because it's a log base 10. Okay, again, the equation you need to know. Put this, put this equation. Also, put the concentration of hydrogen times the concentration of the hydroxide, the OH minus, equal to 10 to the minus 14 molar squared. Put that in your brain, and then put this equation here: pH equals minus the log of the concentration of hydrogen. You need to know those two equations to be able to handle these problems successfully. So keep those, commit those to memory. Okay, so let's run through an example here if we have time. I think we have time. We do. Let's run through an example. Concentration of hydrogen in a mystery solution is 10 to the minus 12. What is the solution's pH and what kind of solution is it? So the example I'm giving you, we have a concentration of hydrogen in this mystery solution equal to 10 to the minus 12 molar. So just in general terms, before we even start to try to solve the problem, is that a really high concentration of hydrogen or a really low concentration of hydrogen? It's really low because it's 10 to the minus 12. That's the same as putting in 11 zeros before the 1. Okay, so it's a really low concentration. Now I'm telling you to find the pH, so I'm just going to use that equation. pH equals minus the log of the concentration of hydrogen. Let's substitute in our concentration of hydrogen. It's 10 to the minus 12 molar. <coughs> now, whenever you handle logs, Remember that the logarithm is basically saying take that exponent and move it down. Okay? So the next step here is going to look like minus and negative 12. This whole part of the equation here, the log of 10 to the minus 12 equals minus 12. It's just like taking the minus 12 and moving it down and getting rid of everything else, right? Does everybody kind of remember that? So what's the log of 10 to the 27? What's that? 10, what's the, what's the log of 10 to the 27? 27, just simply moving the exponent down. That's what the logarithm tells us. So now my pH is equal to 1 times minus 12, which equals 12. <laughs> so the pH of that solution of that solution is 12. Acidic or basic? Basic. And we already sort of knew that it was going to be basic, right? Because we knew that the concentration of hydrogen 10 to the minus 12 molars was a really low amount of hydrogen. And as low hydrogen concentration decreases, we become, become more and more basic. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. 
I'm going I'm to show you a, a, another one here. This one I think is going to be a little more complicated. But yeah, I, before I move on, so what if it was instead of 10 to the minus 12 concentration, 10 to the minus 2? Tell me general terms first. A lot of hydrogen or not a lot of hydrogen? A lot. It's a high concentration of hydrogen. What's the pH? It's 2. So over here, 12 is here on the pH scale. 2 is here on the pH scale. Okay? Now I'm really going to mix it up here for you in example number 2. I want to know the concentration, or I'm sorry, the concentration of OH minus in a mystery solution is 10 to the minus 12. What is the solution, the solution's pH, and what kind of solution is it? So now what I'm giving you is the concentration of OH minus equals 10 to the minus 12. So this one you need a little bit more effort here to figure out, right? What do you need to know? You need to know the concentration of hydrogen. Can I figure out the concentration of hydrogen based off of the information I gave you? I can. How about you guys work on this problem and on Wednesday we'll pick up here.